I am so happy to be here with April Ryan. Thank you so much for being with us today. April Ryan is the only black female reporter covering urban affairs from the White House, a position she has held since the Clinton era. She is only one of three African-Americans who served on the board of the White House Correspondents Association in its 100 year history. But if you're a fangirl like me, you know you can catch April almost daily on CNN as a political analyst. But I also know she's been featured in Essence, Vogue, Cosmo and Elle, just to name a few of the magazines. April, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And I thank John for inviting me. Oh, we are delighted to have you. So let's just get right into it. April, I know this was yeah. not a straight line in your career, but everyone seems to think you are April Ryan of today and it started and bam, you were just April Ryan. Can you chart that journey for us a little bit? How did April Ryan become April Ryan? <laughs> April Ryan has always been April Ryan. She was April Ryan at birth, but the April Ryan that people see today. <laughs> um, I've been in the business for over 30 years broadcasting at the White House for 23. Right. Covered four presidents. This is my fourth president, and we'll see how many more I cover after this moment in history. But what's unfortunate is because of the sensationalism of things that happened inside the White House, Mm -hmm. um, my name is now more known more so than it had been. I've been on the front lines of questioning for presidents for 23 years on issues pertaining to black America and beyond. So, um, you know, I started out like everyone local, uh, traveled around the country doing news, anchoring, reporting, etc. And then I went uh, to the White House and mm. I've been there for 23 years. It's kind of unheard of to sit in one space and place for that long a period of time. Well, April, let's talk about that because 23 years, that is nearly a generation, which is amazing. Can I just say congratulations? Good grief. Let's just start there. <laughs> so we've seen you have some really public interactions on both sides of the aisle, but there seem to be even greater emphasis and intensity placed on female reporters and particularly women of color. Can you talk about how that impact, number one, is it true what I'm seeing on TV that they are giving you perhaps a harder time and how does that impact you doing your job? Well, how does it impact me doing my job? I've been doing this job, the same thing I've been doing for 23 years asking questions, asking issues about finance, asking issues about housing, asking issues about race, policing. Is the water safe to drink? Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to help uh, the people in New Orleans who are stranded on their rooftops? I've been asking those same questions for 23 years. And for whatever reason, um, I've drawn ire for asking those questions now. How does it impact me doing my job? Um, there was, there's been an effort to, uh, silence me, if you will, but you still have communities that need answers to questions from the highest office in the land. It's not about me, it's about the issue. Well, that makes perfect. So I continue to do my job. Right, that makes perfect sense. So it almost seems to me as if people are a little bit intimidated. There are not that many April, there are no other April Ryans, let's be clear. <laughs> but even for female reporters and particularly black female reporters. You don't see that that often. In fact, there's not that much diversity, period, in media, not to mention just journalism. How do we work on changing that? Because I know you are in the trenches and have been there for so long. Tell us, do you have any ideas about that? Well, let's say this. Um, right now, we are having a hard time bringing young African-Americans into political journalism. Um, we need more. We need more people with the understanding of the texture of the community to be able to ask the questions of the community and report on the community. Um, I really would like to see more April Ryans, more Yamiche Alcindor's, more Abby Phillips in that room. And I think about the Kerner Commission report. 
uh, it came together because LBJ wanted to find out, you know, why were there uprisings in Watts and Newark and all across the land um, in 68. In 68, they had the 11 member panel come together and towards the end of the Colonel Commission report, it talked about bringing more people who look like me, people of color, into these spaces to ask questions about the communities that are underserved, to uh, damp down the unrest, the upset in communities. Mm -hmm. So that is, I guess, one of the pieces that we need to put out there more for people to understand that they are needed in this field, that they are needed in the White House, they're needed in the State House, they're needed at City Hall, they're needed at the County Commissioner's Office. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see more of us, not only because you reflect me and you reflect the community, but because you're needed to change the, the tide, if you will, when it comes to our community, a community that is so underserved. Well, that speaks to having more people who can ask the questions, who look like you and me. Do you get any questions or any solicitations about the other side, about them developing a little bit more of a sensitivity about what's going on as opposed to just you having know, folks come and ask them the questions? That on the other side, that there needs to be a sensitivity on all sides to this mm -hmm. because we are a community once again and I'm talking about the broader community. Sure. It needs to understand so much. We are a global community. We are a community not just in Washington, not just in Baltimore, not just in New York, not just in Seattle, but in Paris, um, in Zimbabwe. We are a community, period. And what affects us here affects us there. And I believe there needs to be more sensitivity on all sides to have more people that reflect the diverse nature of who we are as a people so that we can understand because we are not seeing a lot of this in our history books. We are not seeing a lot of, a lot of us are not even getting civics anymore. So we have to rely on the knowledge, the history and the culture of so many people who have an understanding of what is unique to them and their community. And I think there needs to be a broader understanding that diversity makes it work. Um, more inclusion, more inclusive nature of of people, of understanding. I think we need to be more open than we are closed as it relates to us being in that seat to question. Yeah, I think you are spot on there. You know, a lot of folks I hear talking about diversity get really concerned when they hear that word, uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. in communities of color, but in Caucasian communities or Euro-American communities. And I, I once, said recently, you know, diversity, let me talk about baking a cake or a sports team. When you talk about cake, <laughs> you put eggs and butter and oil and vanilla flavor and That's each- That's the traditional recipe for a cake. Right, we gotta add some more if we're talking about in our community, <laughs> right? Putting beets in and all sorts of things to take the, the flour out, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right, but each one of those things adds a different flavor and texture. And right. at the end of the day, the cake is moist and delicious because of all those different elements. Same thing is true in sports, basketball, football, baseball, whatever. You don't have 12 people or five people or nine people playing the same position. They all have a different skill set and attribute that they bring to the table. I heard you recently on CNN talk about racism and it being, it, it's a social construct. It got made up. There's really no such thing. but you know, the hierarchy of the races got made up and it sort of underpins almost everything that we are doing. Are you still getting, as I am, constant pushback on there is something called systemic racism here in this country, particularly through the political lens that you are typically asking your questions? Lisa, um, you know two things that, that are tangible in every sector, and people don't realize it, mm. is the issue of race and money. Yes. And, and I have studied this for the last 23 years, because when you sit in a unique perch like I do, you see so much that comes through and you, you analyze it, because when you have, you have to analyze it to be able to adequately report it and inform people because everything comes to the White House from Water Peace and everything in between. And you want to make sure people have an understanding. And with that said, the understanding that I have is that race touches every facet of life. 
whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And at issue, we thought we were a society when Barack Obama became president, that we were, uh, we were over racism. Girl, they and call we, it post-racial. We, we know that is not the case. Yeah, post-racial, right. We, we thought we were over racism. So, oh, he's now the head of, of the United States. He's the leader of the free world, post-racial. But I said, no, 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 we're not post-racial. We need to say we're post-Obama. And what does post-Obama look like? Right. It looks like this. We're in a polar opposite moment of that moment of trying to heal in various ways. And what does it look like? It looks like this. And depending upon what end of the spectrum you're on, you could say, hey, I'm here um, and I'm taking my country back or I'm taking the world back rightfully. If you're on another side, I'm scared of oppression. Mm -hmm. I'm scared of being shackled again. Even if, even if there are invisible shackles, it's a shackle of oppression or not letting you into the room where it happened. Coining a phrase from Hamilton, the Broadway play. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, um, I'm thinking about, you know, the late great Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to run for president in 1972. She said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. <laughs> and the question is now, that was in 72, she was talking about having a seat at the table. The question is now, are we allowed to go to the table anymore? Right. What does the table look like? Does it include us? So we are now, I'm not even going to say post-racial, I'm going to say we are post-Obama. This is a marker that we're in. These last eight years right. or so are critical markers um, for issues of race in this country. And how we deal with race at this moment tells us which way we're going to go in the next four to eight years. You know, that makes perfect sense. And if we look back historically, it seems that every time there have been two steps forward, there have been three steps back whether it was Lincoln free and the slaves, and then we had reconstruction, but then we had the black codes, and it, it's just Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow. Yeah, and then we have Obama, and now we have 45. Wait a minute, civil rights between? Civil, civil rights, rights between, Jim Crow. you're exactly mm -hmm. correct. But I know that the trail that you have blazed has traversed 30 of those years, as you've said, and I know it wasn't all a straight up trajectory, but you have blazed a mighty wide trail. If you had to give some advice to young girls and women today who want to be the next April Ryan or April Ryan 2.0 or pol journalism in general, what would you have them know? I would not want anyone to be April Ryan. I want them to be uniquely themselves. Um, you know, when I first started out, people used to say, oh, you want to be like Oprah. I, said, I never wanted to be like Oprah. I believe God blessed her tremendously with the gifts that she had. I couldn't handle what Oprah handles. I can handle what April handles. Right. But I, if, if we had a chance to talk to young girls who want to be April, first of all, believe in yourself. You can never overstudy. Understand it's not about you. It's about the good of all the good of people. I mean, I would tell young girls to, 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 Look at all facets of society. Get involved. You have you have yourself, but you have you stand as one, but you are ten thousand behind you. Mm. And for each stride that you make, you're bringing others along with you. So I think we have to remember we're not out of the realm where people are looking at us. People are always watching us. Sure. And we have to remember people are looking at us. And if they're looking at us, they are watching us maybe with a critical eye to see, hmm, that's a piece I want to take from her and take it for myself, or that's a piece I don't like. But nonetheless, we are models. We are role models for today and tomorrow. So think about it. I mean, did Harriet Tubman, when she went back wanting to get the slaves. Do you think that she was worried about what history was gonna say? She wanted to save the fruit and wear the fruit. Mm. You know, I think about those women, you know, those 22 young women from the sorority that I'm from, um, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, when they were part of the suffrage movement, 
I don't know if they were really necessarily worried about history, but trying to advance the cause for all of us. And look at what they did. Right. So I think we have to look at ourselves, but also remember we stand as one, but we are 10,000. So that's what I would say to my younger sisters and even brothers. And just be mindful of who you are. You're uniquely made. And you can do it if I did it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, girl, you stand tall, and we are very proud of you. As we close out this session, uh, let me just ask you about your book, April Ryan Under Fire, Uh, because we are living in some adverse times, and you have seen more than your share. And it seems that adversity has actually fueled you to do even more and to do even better. Now, I'm standing from afar and I'm looking in, but I'm just telling you, it's glowing. You got the halo hanging. So help Re- us. Really? Be- so, okay. Yes, yes. So help me understand. You wrote that book. Uh, talk about how you handle adversity and give us some inspiration to keep it moving forward, regardless of what comes over the transom that you don't expect. I think about what my late mother and father instilled in me, their consistency. One, I think about the fact that my mother used to always tell me when I was younger, and it was, I guess, was the building block for now. Nothing could prepare you for a president of the United States calling you out of your name, for the press secretaries to spotlight you, and for any news media to basically talk about you and put a target on your back. But my mother used to always say, it's not what they call you, but what you answer to. She took that from Dr. King. Right. And that's one of those pieces that stay with me. But at the same time, it's tough when you have a president of the United States, like I said, going after you. You grew up in Baltimore. It's not about you. You're in this business. You know, you didn't come from a silver spoon. Why are you targeted? But what makes me keep going, understanding that it's not about me. It's about us, we the people who are still forming a more perfect union in the midst of growing pains. And understanding that I must be a threat, my little old me must be a threat for some reason. Because I, I'm asking the same questions and observing. And at the end of the day, whether I'm a threat or not, we are still in a society in 2020 where you have people who are still crying out saying they're the least of these. And I am asking questions about those people in particular. And it's not about me. It's about the greater good. It's about me being trained as a journalist, standing on the shoulders of my late parents who were agrarians, standing on the shoulders of those who made a way for me, like the Harriet Tubman's, the Dr. King's, the John R. Lewis's, all of them, standing on those shoulders and doing my job and not being deterred. Um, Too many people died and pushed and protested, sat in for me to be in that unique seat, for me to stay there for 23 years. And they faced worse. So this is nothing. And the Kerner Commission basically wrote me into their report. And our founding fathers, who never imagined an April Ryan being here, and I'm sure they had slaves as well, and I'm a descendant of slaves, Five generations removed from the last known slave in my family, Joseph Dollar Brown, who was sold on the auction block in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I would be doing a disservice to everyone if I walked away because of name calling. It's gotten it was it was harder than that, too. I mean, death threats had the bomb squad at my house. Wow. But no, I'm not walking away. So let me just thank you on behalf of all of us and tell you, girlfriend, you're not a threat. You're worse. You got traction. That's what you got. And we got you. So, girl, you got it. As a sister from another mister, we appreciate you. Thank you so very much. We are grateful. Thank you, Lisa. It was wonderful being with you. John O'Brien, you're a bad brother, too. And 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 I aspire to be you, my friend. You. No, it's yes, a mutual, I do. It's a mutual admiration, Lisa. She is, uh, in addition to everything you talked about, she has, um, she's raising these incredible uh, young, bright lights of hers um, as a responsible parent. She is an investor in Baltimore, Maryland. She's owned. She she has a beautiful 
residence she's bought and has gone up in value. She's bought investment real estate. She's trying to buy the block. She's trying to encourage her neighbors to buy the block. So not only is she a political voice and a community voice, she's also an economic voice. In the, in the vein of Frederick Douglass, who lived there in Baltimore and owned $6 million worth of real estate in 1865. Wow. And he rented that real estate out to working class blacks, which gave him the financial freedom to be a, uh, what we call, him, we call him an abolitionist, but we forget he was actually a businessman. Yeah. There's so much more to April. Ryan than what people see on the television set or read in the paper. She's a she's a deep sister.